put off by how long this video is, don't worry. I tend to jam-pack my videos with as much content, as many details as I possibly can, and I try to talk pretty fast. So while the video is a bit on the long side, I don't repeat myself, and I get into a lot of details about the subject that, you know, pretty much anything that I feel I can comment on and that I think you might find interesting. But hey, if the video is just too long for you to watch, chances are I recorded a shorter version, and the link will be in the description box. It's not an inferior video, it's merely a Cliff's Notes version of this very video. Men in Black 2. Why? Mood review. Okay, so... The people of Zartha wanted, 25 years ago to, or in, in 78, 25 years prior to the events of this movie, wanted MIB to hide the light of Sartha on Earth, but they send it away, and the light of Sartha is a powerful energy source or something yeah, it's it's something important. It's it's the MacGuffin of Zartha. And as a MacGuffin, of course, Selina, the Kylothian, I think, wants it. And so she's been spending 25 years searching the galaxy. Actually, she seems to just fly around and blow up planets. And I, I guess they just really wanted explosions in the opening credits. Anyway, she she's now on Earth again because she got a tip about the light. And yeah, so she goes about seeking it out and Jay is told to go bring back Kay because he's the only one who could who, who knows where it is, because he was the one in charge of it. So he has to be denuralized. I don't know what that even means. Yeah, they have to re restore his memory, and they... They screw over the perfect ending that his character got in the first movie. It's actually really fitting that right after it's described how they screw it over, the character who explains it is punched in the face. That's, that's very, very fitting. This entire backstory, by the way, is delivered in an outrageously distractingly obvious exposition dump in the first few minutes. It just really, they forgot that the medium of film was, you know, your show, don't tell. You know, it's kind of boring to just be told a bunch of stuff. Yes, I appreciate the irony of a guy talking into a camera, telling people that, you know, a guy just telling things. Moving on. Selena, Serlina, something like that. <clears throat> Excuse me. She lands on Earth, and we see that her ship is apparently tiny, which makes it really strange that she was blowing up entire planets, and you, you know, you saw how, I mean, the, the spaceship looked big, not big compared to the planets, but it didn't look tiny, so I don't know if those planets were absolutely tiny, or the people who wrote this just couldn't actually you know, keep track of what they were writing. Actually, I'm pretty sure it's the latter. She lands, and she starts out as this plant creature, and she finds a magazine with the picture of... You know, I don't even remember her name right off the top of my head, but yeah, the... The actress who plays Serlina for the rest of the film in lingerie. And yes, she spends the entire film. 
Yes. So, she takes on that form, and then is mugged, she eats the guy, but then she looks kind of fat and some stuff, so she goes behind a bush and throws up. So, you know, we have a bulimia joke in the first few minutes of the actual film. And it actually really... Not only is it an excellent metaphor for the regurgitated nature of most of the comedy in this movie, but it really just... it, it does set the bar very low and, and lets you know that this is the kind of dumb gag and joke that you're going to be mistreated to for the following 77 minutes. Yes, not counting the credits, this is 77 minutes long. Just think about that for a second. This was a Hollywood movie that actually played in theaters and it's not even like 90 minutes long. Yeah, just... and even so, I mean, I'm not surprised that it's that short because it really looks like stuff was cut out. Like, there are characters that just suddenly disappear completely from the film, other characters that didn't really seem like they needed to be in the film at all. But even so, it is padded like crazy. I'll get into the details in the spoiler video, but anyway. So they bring Kay back, and... Yeah, you know, because people like the dynamic between the two characters in the first one. Ignoring, of course, that Will Smith has now had, or J, Agent J, has now spent five years. You know, it's not necessarily a good sign when the sequel comes out five years later. Anyway, he spent five years getting better at it. He's no longer the rookie. You know, you can't have... It's not going to be the same dynamic. And, I don't know, I guess to sort of change up their dynamic a little bit, Kay is a little, I don't know, stupid and kind of careless at times. He actually, they have him do some of the stuff that Jay did in the first movie. I'm, I'm really not kidding about the repetition of gags. I'll just, I'll get to it in a second. As far as the other characters go, Jay's fine, basically. He is, you know, five years more experience, although he's still making some really stupid mistakes at times. But, yeah, I suppose it's some somewhat in character. He's he's brash, he's young, so sometimes he doesn't really think th things through, and, you know, Kay can somewhat help out there. Rosario Dawson plays the love interest so boring and bland that I just barely remember her name. Laura. Laura. I think it was Laura. She's present. I don't know. It's, it's that thing where Hollywood plays it so safe. They're, they're terrified of alienating, pun not intended, I swear, anyone in the audience from this character so they make her, make the character have absolutely no personality. Yeah, I would actually, I would pay money to see Sin City's Gale face off with Laura in this movie. I would love to see what she had to say to Laura. Other characters, I suppose Johnny Knoxville is almost a character. I personally prefer to call it an extended cameo, but yeah. His acting... It is non-existent, but you already knew that. And he's also really not funny. And I'm not even sure he particularly does something where you think, Ah, oh, that's Johnny Knoxville, you know, I paid to see a movie with Johnny Knoxville doing Johnny knoxville and stuff, and this is what, you know, I really don't think that's the case. I'm not a fan of him. I, I'm, yeah, I know that jackass, right? And, yeah, he... People getting hit in the balls and doing stupid stuff. Yeah. It's... yeah, that's not his character in this movie, so I don't really know why... yeah. Anyway. Other characters. Frank the Pug. You know, the... the one... 
he just he was not in the first one very much because they realized that it was just kind of a you know, it was it was a one joke character and in this yeah they they bring him back and they give him a bigger role for no good reason really just yeah you know people liked it in the first one so they bring it back he's made an agent in this one think about that for a second would that have ever happened in the first movie in the first movie they try to keep it under wraps it is a focus it it's it's part of the focus of the film of the of the actions of the MIB agents is did anyone see this? Do we need to neuralize anyone? Maybe come up with a story? Do we need to, you know, send out a crew to clean up? In this, half the time they don't even bother using the neuralizer. And yeah, stuff is happening. The, one of the first things we see Jay do, he's with Patrick Warburton, by the way, who is completely wasted. Yes. And as as this just completely retarded fellow agent, you know, I don't, I have no idea how he even got into MIB. In the first one, they were like, you know, these are, you know, skilled agents. And in this one, they actually all seem kind of dumb, which I guess explains what's. <sighs> yeah, it explains some things that they're not dumb. I'll get into this in it. I'll get into it in the spoiler video. Anyway, the first thing we see them do, they are... It's causing... It, it should be attracting a lot of attention. And, you know, I get they actually do make sort of a joke out of it. With, oh, New Yorkers are so blasé that they wouldn't even notice. Yeah, but it's just... Then why even bother, actually? Why even bother having MIB in Manhattan if nobody actually notices? Anyway. Yes, the pretty much everything that returns, pretty much everything that was in the first one returns. You know, some of the things, if the character who did it in the first one is no longer, you know, is, is not in this movie, they just move it over to another character. That's basically it, you know. By the way, Frank the Pug, his extended role, I mean, I had no problem with the character in the first one, but in this one, they make him unbelievably obnoxious. He is singing in the car. They, they put him in the suit because, yeah, it's a dog in a suit. It's funny. And he just does not shut up pretty much every scene he's in. He is constantly jabbering on. And it's just not funny. That's, that really sums up the entire movie. It is just not funny. And that is just a major flaw in it. Because it's primarily a comedy. It's actually hardly... That there is no tension in this. I mean, I already mentioned how the bad guy is basically a chick in lingerie. She's not threatening. I have no problem. Lara Flynn Boyle, that's her name. I have no problem with her, and I think she's trying. But with the mainly monosyllabic, singular word sentences she speaks, it's just, at times it actually seems like she's... Like, I, I don't know, like she maybe got dropped on the head as a kid or something. And then at other times, she's speaking completely fluently. Like, is it, I don't know if they, if, like, one of the writers of the script had this idea of, oh, she's, like, always going to say just one word, and she's going to be, like... And then, you know, the others were thinking she should be, like, a, you know, a brilliant villain with, you know, yeah... But yeah, pretty much every element brought back and, you know, often beefed up. And yeah, it just, it it was good in the first one, you know. It was, it, it hit the mark in the first one. And this one, bringing it back and then just, it's not funny and it's really uncreative. And that's actually, a, excuse me, another thing about this film. Excuse me. 
it's severely lacking in creativity. One really obvious aspect is the alien designs. I mean, a lot of them in this one are just basically humanoids. I mean, a couple of them... I noticed some in M at MIB headquarters that basically looked like man-sized birds, and like their, their heads were just birds. And it's just, that's... It's not funny, it's not very creative or interesting, why even bother? And if, if they're gonna do that, I mean, it was basically a guy with a bird head. He might have, they might have had, like, bird skin as well, but that, that's basically it. They're, they didn't even go for, like, a, you know, a big bird. It was, yeah, it's just... And the product placement gets really distracting and obnoxious in this as well. And that actually brings me to something you can really tell with this one. A big part of the reason, probably in the entire reason, why it sucks so bad, why it is so sloppily put together, is the studio. The studio wanted to cash in from the first movie. You know, the first movie made money. The first movie was a pretty unconventional movie in several ways. You know, but this one just tries to copy that. And you should never, you should never try to just copy something else, just, you know, it, the first movie, when, when we see these various things, it's the first time we're seeing it, it's the first one, the time anyone is really seeing it. In this one, it's just, oh, see, we brought that back, hey, you like that Jeeves guy, right, you know, Tony Shalhoub, hey, we made him look even weirder, and he's back now, even though, you know, he was actually told to leave the planet in the first one. Eh, whatever, no one will remember. Linda Fiorentino mm, will explain her away with a single line, that's it. The... And, and... The first movie... opens a door into a fantastic new world that you know, we want to see more of, and it's kind of, it makes sense that it's only opening the door and not taking the full step in, because there's only so much we can really handle. You know, we need to just be introduced at first. You know, this movie should have taken it further, it shouldn't have just copied the first one, you know. So where the first one opens that door, this one just stubbornly stands in the doorway, blocking our path like a kid worried their parent is going to see their bad report card. It is just... irritating. And it is such a massive disappointment, because again, these are the same people, same director, same stars. You know, this could have been excellent. But as it is, there's hardly anything funny in it. There is like I said, there, it is never an exciting film. The effects have gotten better, although, you know, with how lazy they are, it's it's pointless. You know, they might as well have just... And, yeah, at the end of the day, it's just... It's, it's a really good example of how bad sequels get. Now, if you'll excuse me, I have to go neuralize the last 76 minutes of my life. Why only 76? Because if I see the first minute of this movie, I will realize that I shouldn't watch the rest of it. I've reviewed other parts of this series. The links are in the description box. Please rate and comment, and hey, if you like this video, that subscribe button's just waiting for you to click it.